In this lecture, we will cover text analysis. Text analysis can be considered to be a broad umbrella term for a family of techniques that are aimed at analyzing text data. Again, this is a broad umbrella term, and some people may use the term text analysis to mean something more specifically, but here in this case, we're gonna consider this to be the overarching category for any time that we're trying to analyze and interpret data that are in text format. So generally speaking, we can distinguish between two different approaches to analyzing text data, qualitative data analysis approaches and quantitative or computer algorithmic approaches, some of which today are using artificial intelligence and machine learning. So let's start with the qualitative data analysis approaches. These were obviously some of the first approaches because before computers, we needed humans to interpret um, most of anything that we had that was text-based or something like that, or qualitative data in general, whether that's photos, uh, people speaking orally, and that sort of thing. Now, there's different types of qualitative data analysis. So there's content analysis, and this is typically when you think of, let's say you have an open-ended survey item on your annual employee engagement survey, and you have a couple of HR people or a couple of coders that go through and they try to identify different themes that emerge from those um, from people's responses to that open-ended item on that survey. And then they agree, try to find, okay, how many distinguishable categories do we have and so forth. And then they see what emerges in terms of different employee perceptions, attitudes, or behaviors that are reported there. Now, they can also be a little bit more targeted too, specifically if there are specific things that you're looking to code. But the important thing to take away from this is that you can get a really rich interpretation and you get the advantage of a human being looking through all the text. And often you have multiple human beings that are um, independently coding and then coming together iteratively to evaluate their codes, going back and recoding and so forth. So it can be a very time consuming process, but it's a process that can really yield a rich understanding and rich description. Relatedly, we have other types of qualitative data analysis, such as thematic analysis, narrative analysis, discourse analysis, or a general methodology that's referred to, referred to as grounded theory methodology. Uh, grounded theory is more to do with actually building theory within each population or group of interest. So starting, as the name implies, from the ground and building up um, in more of an emergent, organic way. So in terms of some of the advantages of a qualitative data analysis approach, and I should not mention that this really often relies on and is based in different ways of knowing or epistemologies than what traditional quantitative analysis, data analysis would assume or use. And so there's different assumptions about subjectivity versus objectivity and so forth and how meaning um, is derived and how we pull and extract meaning and make sense of our worlds. Okay, so in terms of some of the advantages of qualitative data analysis, one of the biggest things is that you have human beings are analyzing and interpreting the text. And so the advantage of this is that we have really sophisticated computers between our two ears. And our brains are really adept at finding patterns and understanding things in natural language. And although computer-based approaches and quantitative approaches are getting better, um, it's hard to replace a human being in terms of extracting information. Now, of course, as human beings, we introduce all sorts of biases, but so too do algorithmic-based approaches too, because ultimately you have a human being that sets that algorithm into motion or designs it. Now, it also has the advantage of, because human beings are analyzing and interpreting the text, we tend to be pretty good as humans at interpreting and detecting important contextual information, interpreting the tone, such as if there's sarcasm being used, as well as understanding idiomatic expressions or idioms. And so it can be really tricky for a computer, for instance, to detect a statement, or especially in written text, where you have something like, um, let's think of a good example here, um, that is really sick. So a lot of people say today, if something's cool, that is sick. Well based on a computer-based approach, it might code the word sick as being more negative. Whereas in this context, a human who's familiar with the context would perhaps say, oh, actually that means something's very cool. That's a positive thing. So sometimes it can have the exact opposite meaning. And the same goes for sarcasm too. So it's different to say, 
you did super well on that. Awesome job versus you did super well on that. Awesome job. The tone can mean something a little bit different here in terms of the second example uses maybe a sarcastic tone, which could mean perhaps the opposite. Now, again, the advantage of qualitative data analysis, no matter how time intensive it is, is you do get a rich description, rich understanding of your phenomenon of interest. Now, in terms of some of the challenges that we face with qualitative analysis approaches, um, well, one of the things to note is that our end goal with qualitative data analysis is usually not to quantify things. It is actually to retain that qualitative, rich descriptive information about the process, the context, the phenomenon, and so forth. And so we're not looking to count words and things like that. So that can be an advantage, but it also means that it can be challenging to work with and pipe into other things that we might want to use that information for. And so qualitative data analysis in terms of some of the challenges, these can include things like the fact that it requires iterative coding involving human beings and this iterative coding and sense-making process takes time. And it's not gonna be very efficient when you have very large amounts of text data. And especially when that text data is quickly arriving, such as if you're looking, if it's emails or discussion board based or Twitter based or something like that. So it's time and resource intensive, and it's not going to be practical for, practical for large amounts of data. Now, what about quantitative or computer algorithmic based approaches? Well, these have really been allowed to come into their own as computers, technology, computer processing speed and so forth has been increasing very rapidly. And especially with the emergence and the availability of artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms, that has really taken our approach, our computer-based or quantitative-based approaches to text analysis to the next level. And while we're not to the point in which we can really interpret something with the same degree of nuance that human being can, machines are getting closer. Now, in terms of different types of approaches for quantitative or computer algorithmic approaches to text analysis, some people refer to a process called text mining. There's also sentiment analysis, natural language processing, latent semantic analysis, and computational linguistics. Now, these are not necessarily mutually exclusive analyses or categories here. Rather, you can do sentiment analysis using natural language processing, for example. But these are some of the common terms that you see flying around today. Now, in terms of some of the advantages of quantitative or computer algorithmic approaches to text mining or text analysis, one of the biggest is that it's a computer-driven approach. And so what this means is that you can let the computer, once you set it into motion and set up the model, the algorithm, or the lexicon that you're going to use, and I'll explain what that means in a second, you can really do things quite quickly. Now, the accuracy could be one of the challenges here and interpreting the tone, the context, and, and what unit of analysis or idea you're going to use or try to interpret. Now, because it's computer-driven, that means it's often efficient and scalable for large amounts of text, and particularly when we think about text that's arriving to us very quickly. And we should note too that the interpretation accuracy tends to be improving with as technology gets better, as our algorithms get better, as we better train our models, especially when you consider the machine learning approaches. Now, in terms of some of the challenges, whereas with qualitative data analysis approach, humans are really good at detecting context, tone, and idiomatic expressions, and those really deep characteristics of the text itself and reading between the lines, so to speak, this is gonna be more challenging for most computer-based approaches. And often these are gonna focus on translating rich qualitative information into quantitative data of some kind. And so this means there's gonna be some loss usually um, in terms of the richness of the information when you translate something or convert it from qualitative to quantitative in nature. But it does have the advantage of you can then, once it has quantitative properties, you can apply descriptive statistical analysis, inferential statistical analysis um, to further assess and analyze the phenomenon of interest. So let's now look at a couple examples. And we'll start with a lexicon-based sentiment analysis approach. And so this is a fairly rudimentary approach, but it's a good approach for understanding how we can use machines or computers to help us analyze text data. 
And so sometimes sentiment analysis is called opinion mining. And the idea is you can look through a body of text or a corpus and you try to identify what are the different meanings and what has emerged here in terms of overall feeling, emotion, affect, sentiment, moods, and so forth. So sentiment analysis is really about the process of assessing the express feelings across whatever unit or token of text that you're interested in. And so in terms of unit of text, we can look at the word level, the sentence level. If we're looking at a literary work, we could look at the chapter level. If we're interested in assessing discussion boards or analyzing discussion board data, we could look at the thread level. Um, we could look at the post level. It really depends on what you're interested in discovering and uncovering. Now, when I say lexicon-based sentiment analysis, it means that we're using a lexicon or dictionary of terms that, are, that have an associated sentiment with them, okay? And so I'll show you what this means here. So for example, let's say we have the following words, outstanding, winner, happy, strength, innovate, reject, sad, anger, and hell. So these words, let's say, appear in a discussion post that someone's made. And then we've decided to focus on the word as our unit of interest or our token of interest here in terms of what we're going to analyze. And so there's different types of um, dictionaries or a lexicon that we can use. Bing and AFIN lexicons, these are two very common ones that we can use. The Bing lexicon, it is actually going to um, just do a dichotomous code of certain words. So whether it's positive or negative, and that's positive sentiment or negative sentiment, whereas AFIN is going to range from negative five to five, where more positive values mean more positive sentiment, and more negative values mean more negative sentiment expressed by that word. And so what we would do behind the scenes is we would take our body of text, and we would then restructure it such that we're looking at each row in our data frame, for example, has a word, and we correspond Every instance in which, let's say, the word outstanding appears in our text, then we associate with it the Bing, either the Bing positive value or the AFIN lexicon value here, which is five. And so you can imagine you go row by row by row, and then suddenly you can start quanti you're quantifying these things, you can start counting them, and you can pipe them into additional data visualization, analysis, and so forth. So noticing here, um, I've ranked these in terms of the AFIN lexicon here. And so you'll notice that outstanding, this is obviously positive, but it would be ranked as a five. So this is a strong positive sentiment here. Winner, it's a four, so strong, but not as strong as outstanding. Happy, it's a three. Strength is two. Innovate is a one. Now they don't have zero, so it's either it's going to be a forced choice here essentially, because essentially they're assuming all other words are going to be quote unquote neutral. Okay, which would be the zero. And then you can see when we get to the negative side of things, reject or reject or reject, depending on how you want to interpret that, would be negative one, sad, negative two, anger, negative three. You can see it has a more negative sentiment here, and then hell, negative four. And then I didn't put any negative fives because these tend to be um, pretty coarse language. And so I'll, I will give you a heads up that if you are looking through at the word level at the Bing or the AFIN lexicon, it's fairly common for these dictionaries to include words that are going to be very coarse, perhaps profane, derogatory, and words that maybe we would be socially unacceptable or socially undesirable um, at a, even at a societal level too, depending on what society you're in to actually say these words out loud or in text and that sort of thing. That said, these dictionaries are meant to be expansive, so you could analyze all sorts of text. These aren't just meant for the workplace. These could be used for all sorts of discussion boards, all sorts of text and things like that. Now, with that said, um, with, with that in mind, we also want to also consider that some words, again, depending on the tone, could have the opposite meaning. And this is where these aren't going to obviously capture sarcasm and something or, or something to that extent. And perhaps the way in which someone says a word could actually con uh, could connote a stronger level of, let's say, negative uh, sentiment behind it. Um, so for instance, if you say that this person was rejected from a job and you that's the stem is reject here or reject, well, you could perhaps say this in a more strong way or if it's written in a stronger way, it'd say, um, you're rejected and put an exclamation point after that and suddenly that might carry a heavier negative sentiment with it and move it on down the list but that's not going to be captured 
um, in either lexicon here. Okay, so to give you an idea of how the, the, the number or the proportion in the Bing lexicon here, the number of words that it captures that are negative versus positive, um, it's interesting to see that it's actually uh, over two thirds of the words are negative that are in the lexicon, at least in the English language here, and 30% and uh, less than slightly less than a third are positive, so 70% versus 30%. Um, and then if you look at the AFEN scores ranging from negative five to five, interestingly, 39%, uh, which is a, a large proportion here, a, a clear majority there, are um, negative twos. So not really strong negative sentiment, but having some level of negative sentiment. And we see we have relatively few fives and fours, as you can see here, which makes sense. We have very few, relatively speaking, um, extreme words in the English language in that regard. And again, these dictionaries, these are a starting point. Um, also, you can add to them, you can subtract from them in terms of adding words that you aren't captured already in the dictionary, maybe slang and things like that that you know are used in your population of interest, or maybe it's jargon specific to your organization that you could include. And you could also remove words or recode them, but these dictionaries are great places to start. Now, as a quick no, um, another kind of deep dive example, let's talk about na natural language processing, which can also be used for sentiment analysis. And when you're talking about natural language processing or NLP, this is really when we use a computer program that gleans understanding and, and semantic meaning from large amounts of text containing language in its natural form. Okay, and so instead of distilling things down to the word level, natural language processing really takes into context the syntax, the structure, um, and in that way, more of the context surrounding words. And so you're more likely, depending on how good your algorithm is, to get more accurate extractions of meaning and sentiment when using natural language processing as compared to a lexicon-based approach to sentiment analysis. So contemporary approaches tend to use machine learning algorithms in which models can be trained using data to generate um, interpretation rules, to extract meaning, to provide summaries of the text and to even translate text into other languages um, in some kind of automated manner. Now, especially with language translation, this is a really challenging thing to do well. Um, obviously, you could do something like Google Translate or a dictionary um, that can convert from one language to another, but especially when you have idioms involved or idiomatic expressions, that can be really challenging to do in an accurate manner. And in, when we're using this an approach by human beings, we would typically use what we call a translation back translation approach, which means that let's say we're going from English to Spanish. Well, you would have one person convert the text from English to Spanish, and then you'd have another person come and then convert the, um, the translated version that is now in Spanish and translate it back to English. And then you would compare the original, trans, uh, the original English text with the back translated English text and to see if there's any kind of game of telephone going on here, any kind of drift in terms of meaning. And that really can illustrate how challenging this process is. And this is challenging when it comes to translating, for example, a survey, if you have a multinational organization, translating a survey that's done, let's say in English in the United States, but you also have a facility, let's say in Ecuador, and you need to translate it to Spanish, well, that can be really challenging. You could have a human doing that or increasingly natural language processing might be used. And so some larger organizations today, Intel, for example, um, they have entire natural language processing teams and data scientists that work on developing these algorithms um, and, and refining these approaches. And you can really train them using more and more data to help establish interpretation rules, extract meaning and identify entities and so forth. Like, is this a person, a proper, uh, an event or whatever it is that you're interesting, interested in pulling from those data. So this just barely scratches the surface on what text analysis is. It's again, a broad family of analyses um, it's rapidly evol evolving, especially from the quantitative approach to using it, the statistical approach to text analysis, uh, particularly when it involves machine learning algorithms and artificial intelligence. And that's our capabilities are just going to continue increasing in that regard. And it'll be really interesting to see in um, 
five years time, 10 years time, 20 years time, how much we've advanced and how much we've closed that gap between how well a human can interpret text versus how well a machine can interpret text and drive meaning from it. So this wraps up the lecture on text.